This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3261, Lecture 23A on Failure Theories. So far we have looked at structures being loaded with tension, compression, bending, shear, usually not a combination, although we sometimes get an axial load as well as a bending load. We've looked at mostly ultimate failure of the structures. We haven't used a lot of yield except a little bit for compression and we haven't done much with the proportional limit nor with fatigue. We're going to learn all about those things in Arrow 3271. We've mostly worked with a single load condition, one single load causing the single stresses. We're going to start looking today at multiple loads in multiple directions, kind of like we did, we started to do with principal stresses and more circle. We've already learned that the margin of safety for a structure when we have a single loading, a simple type of stress, our factor of safety looks like this, where we compare the applied stress to the allowable and our margin of safety is this variant of the same thing, where the factor of safety is good if it's one, bad if it's less than one. The margin of safety is good if it's zero and it's bad if it's less than zero. We've been focusing on the single load and we're about to start looking at multiple loads in more detail, kind of like we did for principal stresses. What our failure theories do is propose different ways of combining stresses. Think about this. Now we already saw when we have stresses or forces on all dimensions are more than one face of an element, we get stresses in all three directions. And we saw before when we we're looking at Mohr's circle how a three dimensional stress state can be written this way and how our principal stresses, the maximum shear stresses, occur by just taking half the difference between the stresses on the different faces. We learned all about this when we covered more circle. We also looked in more detail at more circle looking at how to combine stresses on different faces. Now before we get into this lecture further, since we're using a number of Shigley figures for this lecture, we want to make clear the nomenclature where we're using FTU and FTY and FSU for the allowables since we're aerospace engineers, Shigley calls those capital STU or just capital SU, capital STY or capital SY, capital S SU and capital S S. So be aware of these things as we see the figures that are coming up. So the first failure theory we're going to look at is the what's called the maximum normal stress theory, which is kind of like calculating our principal stresses and just evaluating that against our allowable. As aerospace engineers, we're going to compare that to FTU. So this is our principal stress equation on the upper left. This reference is when I used to call this the Aerospace Stress Supplement. I decided that uh, acronym didn't look so attractive, so I changed it to the Ac Aerospace Stress Handbook rather than Stress Supplement. But at any rate, uh, if we wanted to find out how good it was calculating our principal stresses and evaluating them against the allowable, what we would do is draw a failure envelope, which means we would draw our two stresses, the stress in the one direction, uh, on the horizontal axis, the stress on the perpendicular face, the stress 2 on the vertical face. And what we would do is we would compare that value should be all the way up to the allowable. We should be able to good for the allowable, good for the allowable in tension, good for the allowable in compression. So if we plotted the stress that we see on a horizontal axis and we should be able to go from 0 all the way up to the maximum stress. If we decided to normalize that stress by just dividing it by the allowable. Now what's shown here is that sigma 1 divided by the yield allowable. And that's how Shigley was showing it. And what they were evaluating here is yield. What we would do is divide that by FTU, the ultimate allowable. But what Shigley did here was he evaluated the stress that we have 
divided by the allowable. And if we did that, if we use that ratio, if we plot that ratio, that normalized value on the horizontal and vertical axis, if we have only sigma 1, we would expect to be able to go all the way to sigma 1 without fail. And if we had only sigma 2, we would be able to expect to be able to go to all the way to sigma 2 without fail. If we had sigma 1 compression, we should be able to go to all the way to sigma 1 compression. And if we had compression on the two face, we would be able to expect to be able to go all the way to that allowable here. Now, what that means is if we suspected that there's no interaction between those stresses, we would imagine that we ought to be good for anything up to s f to u and anything up to f c u anything up to f to u and anything up to f c u anything inside this any stress state which falls inside this curve is good anything that falls outside this box would be bad now if we go and plot stresses we plot stresses like let's say we set a first certain stress value to a positive sigma 1 and then we start like positive sigma 1 and then we start increasing the sigma 2 until it fails and we get a point here and we go to another stress and increase until we fail and so on and then we do the same thing come up to some stress level and put compression until we fail and we plotted the points of failure as is shown here. Now if we plotted those points, this is some data that suggests that failures occur rather than in the on this box's border, they occur on this ellipse, something looking like this. What this implies, is now so few of these values are outside the box, that means that the theory is conservative, others of these fall inside the box, which means the theory is unconservative. All of this is unconservative, and all of this is unconservative. Therefore, it's proposed that this may not be conservative enough. For this reason, while this approach of comparing FTU to FSU, which basically means we're taking the max principal stress and we're comparing it to FTU or FCU depending on if it's tension or compression minus one that's our margin of safety this whenever we do this we're really applying this maximum normal stress theory if that was the only thing that we did to evaluate failure now that's not the only thing that we do to evaluate failure but if we did that's what that would mean let's look at the next failure theory the maximum shear stress theory this says hey since some folks have proposed that all stress failures are based on shear and rather than normal stress what this does is take the maximum shear stress and compare it to the allowable for example you use this equation to calculate the max shear stress and then you just compare it to FSU if your margin of safety is positive it's good the structure is good. Oops, that's a minus, not a equals. And if it's less, then it's bad. Now, if that's all we did, that would be using the maximum shear stress theory. And if we look at the curve on the next slide, what that does is that gives us this envelope. It will give us the envelope looking like this. This becomes our theory for that case. And you can see that while this appears to be better than our principal stress theory, and it appears to be conservative just about everywhere, maybe a little bit too conservative for the max shear cases. However, we never do this either. In aerospace, what we should do is check all of the stresses, the max principal stress against its allowable and the max shear stress against its allowable. But if we were to just use the maximum shear stress theory, we'd only look at that shear stress allowable. Now, another method that's completely different is the distortional energy theory. And basically what they noted is, they noted that when we had a structure that had a hydrostatic stress state, it tended to fail at a higher level than for any other kind of stress state. So what's a hydrostatic stress state? Hydrostatic, it looks like I have a typo there. It says hydrostatic. 
Hydrostatic means that you have like a pressure all around, like if you took a part and dumped it down in the bottom of the ocean, that pressure acting on it. Now the hydrostatic stress changes a function of depth, but if your part is small relative to the depth, then it looks like a uniform pressure. What they note is if you have a, unif if a hydrostatic or a uniform pressure condition where the stresses are the same in all directions, we failed at a higher value than for other stress states. So they postulated, ooh, it looks like it's the shear stress or the distortional component of stress that causes failure. So what they said is, hey, let's go ahead and take our total stress state, that's shown to the left, and let's imagine that it consists of a hydrostatic component and a distortional component. The hydrostatic component is just the average stress on the element. All the stress is the same. That causes no shear stress. Remember, if all those, if the stresses on two faces are the same, the normal stresses with no shear stress, then there will be no shear stress for any rotation of uh, stress. What's left after we subtract that from the actual principal stress state is the distortional energy component, this distortional component, which is shown to the right which is just the stress we started with minus that average stress. So what this idea said is, hey, look, let's go ahead and divide our stress state into these two fictitious components, the average stress and that distortional stress. And then what we're going to do, rather than removing that distortional stress, we're going to remove the energy due to that distortional stress. That's what we're going to see next. Okay, so what it's basically going to say is take the stress, the energy of the current stress state, remove the hydrostatic component of the energy, and that leaves us with the distortional component of the energy. We're then going to combine that distortional energy with the distortional energy of a failing tension sample to come up with a failure theory. This is how we derive it then. So what that means is our average stress, if we have a three-dimensional stress, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, the average stress is just the average of those. The strain energy, since the strain energy is just the strain times the stress, and if it's in the, in the linear range, remember it's one half that value. So if we plug our average stress into that, we get this equation for the strain energy for that hydrostatic portion of the stress. Now if we have three to each stress state, these are our three-dimensional strains, so we can plug those in to our equation, and this gives us the energy per unit volume of that stress state. Now the energy for that average stress is shown here. And if we now subtract that average energy from the other, we get what we call the distortional energy uh, of, the, of the part under that loading. So it's the energy of the distortional component of stress. Okay? We're not going to use this yet. We're developing our stress state. So up at the top we see that distortional energy we just derived and now what we're going to do is compare it to the distortional energy that is in a tension sample since mostly the allowables, the FTU and the FTYs of these materials are developed through tension tests. If we then calculate the energy, the distortional energy associated with a tension test, that uniaxial load, we get this energy in the middle. If we equate these two equations which means we compare our distortional energy to the distortional energy of a failing tension sample, we get the equation shown below. And as long as that is less than or equal to our allowable, we're good. Now what's shown here is that it's greater than or equal to, because what that's saying is that's our failure criterion. That means we need to be below that value. Okay? So writing using our aerospace nomenclature, what that means is our energy must be less than this value. The allowable FTY must be less than this distortional component of the energy. This is called the von Mises stress. So the failure criterion shows above that that von Mises stress needs to be less than FTY. And we can write the von Mises stress, I'm calling it F for the calculated stress von Mises, is given by that second equation here. This is called the von Mises stress. 
after the guy that developed it. It's called the distortional energy stress since it's based on uh, just evaluating that distortional energy. It's called the octahedral stress because it corresponds with that octahedral plane when we looked at those Mohr circle three-dimensional stresses, that octahedral plane, the shear stress we talked about there. It's also called the shear energy von Mises, von mises henkley equation. Now if we have a plane stress, then this simplifies to this equation where sigma prime is just sigma von Mises. So we can write it like this, and for a three-dimensional state, here is our von Mises stress. We can just write it directly like this. If we have a three-dimensional principal stress state, our second equation works. If we just have a three-dimensional element with normal and shear stresses, you can plug into this last equation shown here. Now this becomes even simpler if we have a plane stress state, which means one of the phases un is unstressed, like the skin, the, out, the normal to the skin is not stressed, then the fourth equation here simplifies to the fifth equation, and that's our plane stress equation in plane. What the von Mises theory does, it's really a yield theory, because it's based on linear stress change. If we go into the nonlinear stress range, it's not really valid, which really means this is for comparing the von Mises stress to the yield allowable, not the ultimate allowable. However, it's very commonly used against to be comparing against the FTU, even though that's not strictly correct. And this is our failure criteria, criteria then that the that stress needs to be less than FTY or equal to. Okay? Now what this does is predict this failure envelope. Remember, you can see the dashed line was our shear stress theory. The von Mises theory, or the distortional energy theory, gives a smoother curve, and it seems to match the data very well. Now once again, we're comparing for yield, not for ultimate, and it matches very well for yielding of the material. Okay? So this von Mises stress is one you will encounter often in industry. Now if we had pure shear, then this simplifies to these equations down here, and this is where we get, remember before from the Mohr circle we saw that the shear stress could be approximated as about half the tension stress, and what this says is that if we don't know what the shear allowable of the material is, we can predict it or, or uh, approximate it as 0.577 times FTU. That relation that the shear stress is roughly equal to 0.577 times FTU comes from applying the distortional energy theory and applying it as we see in this slide here. We're going to see this relation later when we get into bolts. Now, for our purposes, most of the materials we're going to deal with, we're going to be able to find in our handbook appendix or an MMPDS5. We're going to be able to see, find both an FTU and an FSU, so this formula is not needed. But if we ever have a structure like fasteners where we know what the tension allowable is but then not the shear allowable, this will give us probably one of our best estimates for the shear allowable of that material. That's all we have. Make sure you see part B on interaction equations.